This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Russ Capper. Hi, I'm Russ Capper, and welcome to episode number 116 of the Energy Makers Show. Our topic today the emerging world of natural gas vehicles. And my guest, Dr. William Epling, Associate Professor Chair of the University of Houston's Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department. He also happens to be the president of the Greater Houston Natural Gas Vehicle Alliance. That's coming up right after this. is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Russ Capper. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show, coming to you now from the Wolf Center of Entrepreneurship at the University of Houston. And I'm very pleased to have as my guest, Dr. William Epling, Associate Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering here at the University of Houston, and also President of the Natural Gas Vehicle Association in the greater Houston area. Bill, welcome to the Energy Maker Show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. You bet. So connect the dots for us. Professor, you know, on one hand, and president of the Natural Gas Vehicle Alliance. So about four years ago, um, the there's a few companies here in the Houston area. So Anadarko Petroleum, Southwest Energy, um, Centerpoint Energy, and Apache got together and wanted to start thinking about the natural gas vehicles use in the area and how to promote those. And they came to the University of Houston um, and approached UH to ask them about, you know, whether they wanted to be involved. What they were really looking for at the time was a kind of a, a non-biased partner, somebody who would be, you know, non-biased could do the research and have a have an opinion there or or do the research behind the numbers that were without coming out of center, in the business. without being in the business. Yeah, okay. Wow. And so the found those four founding companies and University of Houston are the five founders of the alliance okay. for the Greater Houston area. Okay. So were you associated with the alliance from the beginning? So at the beginning I was not. We had a professor here from the Hobby Center, Jim Granado, who was the first president of the alliance. And he's uh, his main area was really in the policy area. And so that was what they were looking for at the time was, you know, this was just now being established. This natural gas thing was just coming online. People were starting to get more confidence behind it. And so what they were thinking of is what is going to be the U.S. drive, the Texas drive, the Houston drive? What are what's going to be promoted by the government sides of things, the company sides of things, et cetera? And so they were interested in what the policies were around natural gas and vehicles specifically. However, over time, with that confidence, with the evolution and the growth of natural gas vehicles in the area, now they're they were kind of interested in somebody who might have a more technical side of things to it, and so I was approached at that point. And there you are, cool. And so, so what do you think about the cause? I mean, I'm just I'm blown away by what the exploration and production people have done and the quantity of natural gas and the fact that it's pretty clean. It's, I mean, you'll, you'll hear people call it this. It's an energy revolution going on right now. Right. So, I mean, the you know we've, we've talked about oil, we've talked about coal, we've talked about nuclear. There's a variety of things out there that are the traditional ones. Right. But the sudden boom in the availability of, of attainable natural gas. So right. there's natural gas pockets that people have known about that aren't tail, but now all right. of a sudden shale gas. You right. can get it and you can get a lot of it. Right. And that lot part has really changed the, the landscape in Texas and in the US for energy. Not only for energy, but chemicals as well, which oh, yeah. is another part of the chemical engineering side of things. Oh, yeah. You could see a CEO of a large chemical company in 2005 saying, we will never build another chemical plant <laughs> right. in the United States. Right. Natural gas is just 
too expensive. Right. In 2012, you could say see the same company CEO right. say we are building a plant just south of the Houston area. Right. Right, because of the cheap source of natural gas. So the obvious extension, natural gas has always been used for power. Right, we have power plants or natural gas based that have been going up all over the place at a much higher rate than coal fire, and you know I think that traditional use of natural gas will be consistently there over the years, and it's only going to be cheaper now. Um, but now there are other opportunities for it. Making chemicals is one I just mentioned, but vehicles is the other very large one, and you have some very major players looking at how to get into this game. Okay, so uh, it's been a topic of interest to the energy makers for a little bit more than a year now, too. And uh, and, and there's always this discussion about burning it in mm -hmm. a vehicle yes. is cleaner. You, being in yes. the chemistry world, might know, is that true or false? And if it is true, is it significantly cleaner? It's both. Okay. The answer is it's <laughs> okay. true and false. Okay, okay. so... There are some traditional emissions that we worry about from engines. Mm -hmm. One of them is NOx, one mm -hmm. of them is particulate. Mm -hmm. So diesel engines are typically the stereotype in terms of that you see the black plume. Right. Those are old diesel engines. The new right. diesel engines are significantly cleaner. If you see that, they're, they're bad diesel engines, right? Right. Gasoline engines, um, you don't see the particulate, but there's some there. It's just not, not visible. Um, so the particulate side of things is from the combustion of those heavier hydrocarbons. Natural gas, the lighter hydrocarbon, you're not going to see the particulate make that you see from gasoline or diesel engines. The NOx is from the combustion of the, the nitrogen in the air mm -hmm. and the high temperatures mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. The NOx numbers coming out of a natural gas engine are also significantly lower. The hydrocarbons that are typically measured are called non-methane hydrocarbons, right? They're also significantly lower. What's The key there is the non-methane hydrocarbons. So the engine is not going to combust 100% of every hydrocarbon molecule going in. And that is true of the natural gas engine as well. Some methane is going to come out. Methane has a very bad name associated with it in terms of global warming. Mm -hmm. It is 21 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. Mm -hmm. And so although its total coming out may be not that great, as more and more vehicles hit the road, there is no doubt that the EPA might turn their eye to it. And we're going to see that as an emission that they're going to go after from natural gas vehicles. And it is there. Okay. And now I don't know this about you, but let's let's just say for a minute that you are a, a, a big environmentalist. Mm -hmm. Would you, and, and you had to champion that cause no matter what, would you think, and you had to choose between diesel, gasoline, or natural gas mm -hmm. vehicles, mm -hmm. which one would you choose? I have a bias. Okay. I used to work at Cummins Engine Company, okay. which is the largest independent diesel engine manufacturer wow. in the U.S. Wow. So I have a bias towards diesel, and my specific work there was cleaning up the emissions from diesel engines. Okay. So I know how clean they can be. Okay. Having said that, yeah. the natural gas engines are cleaner. Okay. I do think that we should be paying attention to the environmental footprint that we leave and the things that we do for yeah. future generations. Sure, absolutely. We may not, they may not be as significant as we think, but you don't take that risk. Okay. So natural gas vehicles, I think, should play a role. They're cleaner in that sense. And I think that those methane emissions can be mitigated okay. through a very similar technology to the catalytic converter on a gasoline engine. Okay. Is there research going on in that category yes, right now? Yes, there is. Okay. So at the Energy Research Park here at the University of Houston, oh, wow. the okay. Texas Center for clean engines, emissions, okay. and fuels, okay. right, is used to be the diesel research center. Okay. But they've evolved over time, right. as have the rest of us, right. towards this natural gas right. thing. And um, there's now a natural gas pipeline to the center. They have engines in the center where they are looking at emissions and engine performance of dual fuel diesel and natural gas engines. Interesting. And so um, there's research going on right now at University of Houston doing that. Okay. All right. We'll be back with more with Dr. William Epling after this. Hi, I'm Russ Kaplan. Welcome to another edition of The Drilling Bits, brought to you by Sickage LLP. I'm here once again with Greg Price, partner with Sickage, and the author of The Drilling Bits. Greg, good to see you again. Thanks, Russ. It's good to be back again. Are we going to solve some problems today? We are. We're going to talk a little bit about Energy Suite from Sickage, powered by Microsoft Dynamics. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one of the things we hear quite a bit from potential customers is that, my gosh, it takes so long to implement this product. Obviously, yeah, that's what everybody thinks about some of these systems. That's right. Well, one of the things that Microsoft has done in the last few years is they've invested a lot in their technology and the ability to rapidly deploy this product. I'm gonna give you three key points in this regard. The first has to do with Rapid Start and using the Rapid Start tool set that is contained within the ERP solution set for Energy Suite. So it allows you to go from weeks 
to days and turning on the functionality, which not only saves you time on the consulting side, but also saves your people's time. So that's a very important uh, part of the solution that we bring to the table. The second point has to do with uh, learning. As we all know, sometimes uh, people are resistant to change. Sure. And so having the ability to learn quickly and move efficiently with a new process or a new technology also brings a much more rapid rate of return to a potential customer. And because it is Microsoft product, it looks and feels like Windows, Outlook, and all the other tools that you work with every day already. That helps. Absolutely. And lastly, uh, it's easy from a standpoint of use and simplicity. Because you're already familiar with it, as I like to say, nobody does Microsoft better than Microsoft. And so while many of our competitors say they integrate with Microsoft, they are not Microsoft. And so because of that, you get a single solution that works from beginning to end and allows the users to become more inspired to seek out answers to questions where maybe before they were more mechanical in the way they approach things, but now they have the ability to be more inquisitive and actually drill down and get to the answer of why things the way they are from the reports. Really cool. So how many people are using uh, Microsoft NAV out in the oil patch? Well, you know, I think it's going to be hundreds or thousands. If you take a global basis, it's definitely well in the thousands. Okay, really cool. All right, and that wraps up another edition of The Drilling Bits, brought to you by Sickage LLP. See you again next week. This is The Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to The Energy Maker Show with your host, Russ Capper. All right, continuing on with Dr. William Epling. So when you get to the uh, category of natural gas vehicles, you have LNG and you have CNG. Yes. And, you know, from my uh, research involvement in the space, I know LNG seems to be ideal for the big 18-wheelers mm -hmm. and, and the big trucks. And uh, But there's more and more cars uh, in the CNG category. Yes. I mean, do I have that right? You're and, correct. And, and is there a lot more to that story than what um, I just I don't said? know that there's more to the story. I mean, yeah. LNG would be more ideal, I think, for all of them if it was practical. Okay. So the LNG is is denser in terms of right. the energy. It's liquid right. in terms of the in, as opposed to the gas. Right. And so you get you could get a longer drive out of okay. it if you had LNG. But transporting LNG in a car yeah. is not nearly as practical as you have from a big rig. The big rig is on the road all the time. Right. Right. And what's happening with the LNG is some of it is vaporizing continuously. So in a mm -hmm. car, you drive 20 minutes, you get to work. Or Houston, mm -hmm. you drive for 45 minutes, you right. get to work. Right. And uh, you turn your car off. Well, that LNG is continuously wanting to evaporate. Okay. And so you're losing fuel content okay. the whole time. Big rig, you don't have that problem. You're on the road yeah. as many right. hours a day as you can. The right. blow off is minimal compared right. to the amount of use. So I think right. for the 18 wheelers, you will see, or the big engines in general, right. mining, shipping, trains, um, and the big rigs, you're going to see LNG as, as the primary fuel for natural gas vehicles. For vehicles, you'll see compressed natural gas. The other side of that is it's much easier to get compressed natural gas into something than it is. Liquid. Right, right. Well, I, I've uh, sort of followed the movement across Texas and know that the uh, I think the state legislature here has sort of been pushing and is yes. pro uh, natural gas. Yeah. There's the the Texas Triangle, the ability yes, to that's try correct. to that's right. You know, and, and that's both CNG and LNG, mm -hmm. is it not? Yes. Okay. And uh, but I'm I'm particularly fascinated in the CNG category by the ability. Uh, there already are home compressors available. I mm -hmm. think most of them are made in mm -hmm. Italy right now. Uh, but there's a movement going to, yes. to to improve that category. In fact, there's research that we covered on the show taking place at the University of Texas. It is it, it, question number one? Every time I have this discussion with people, people say, "Man, that sounds dangerous to have a home compressor of natural gas in your garage." Is it? Uh, no, I, I live out in the country a little bit. Yeah. I have a propane tank in my yeah. backyard, yeah. and I have a generator that's attached to it because I do live out in the country. When okay. a hurricane comes, I've still got power. Okay. People attach propane tanks to their grills all the time, mm -hmm. right? Now, mm -hmm. this is a little different, but it's not that different. Yeah. There are some safety issues, but I mean, come on. When you look at gasoline pumping well, stations, right? right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. go back to the old days where it was it was pretty dangerous right. then, too, compared right. to now. The, the technologies, they, they can keep up with these things right. very, very easily. Right. Well, it just seems to me that if, if there was progress 
rapid progress mm-hmm. made uh, on on home compressors, mm-hmm. and if natural gas stayed as inexpensive as it is, which I know a lot of people that don't want it to because they're they're in mm-hmm. that business, but it would be such a cool substitute for gasoline or or a dual fuel vehicle. To me, it, it would be a huge promise. It, you're going to see both. I think you'll see at home stations. I mean, there's going to be some costs associated with that, but then you're also going to see fueling stations just like we do today. Right. Right. They'll be attached to a convenience store somewhere. Right. And um, the reason for that is with compressed natural gas, you're not going to get the same distance of driving currently mm-hmm. that you could out of a liquid fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, that could change as they come up with new technologies. But if you're going to go on a road trip, you're going to need to fill up somewhere. Right. And so you'll see both. Right. Um, the other thing is when it comes to the fueling stations is it's kind of a chicken and egg thing right now. Right. So you can go down the road and you'll see some pickup trucks that are natural gas right. vehicles and you got to see the big stickers on the side. The people are very proud of them. Right. But for a car, right, you either buy your own fueling station at your home. Right. And you don't take it on road trips. Right. Or you got to find a fueling station in, in the Houston area. They are there. Right. But they're not on every corner like a gasoline station. Right. Do you do you give up performance in a vehicle if you have a vehicle that's a dual fuel vehicle? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you the the way they're designing them mm-hmm. is they're optimized for both. If there's a situation where the liquid, the gasoline or the diesel makes more right. sense for power or right. something like that, right. it will use that. Right. If it's for natural, I mean, so you, they can change fuel mixing ratios and things like that to optimize performance. Actually. Okay. Does that mean if I'm running a car that's dual fuel that it's going to have more horsepower running gasoline than CNG? Uh no. Okay. It doesn't have to. I mean, again, it depends on the interest. I think most of them right now, you have a lot of dual fuel interest out there from um, more on the diesel side of things, because I think the stigma with diesel is part of it, as well as the fact that there's just a lot of natural gas and it's just cheap. Okay. Right. So, um, but the other thing with the, you know, the engine manufacturers are, you're seeing a lot of more pure natural gas vehicles coming out. Okay. Um, in terms of passenger vehicles. Okay. Fleet trucks are, you see a lot of pure natural gas vehicles now. So the dual fuel, um, I, I can't say I honestly know what the ratio is in terms of numbers, but I think the drive is towards the pure natural gas engine as opposed to dual fuels okay. right now. I'm curious, in the uh, Natural Gas Vehicle Alliance, do you guys talk about the tipping point, you know, that, that they, they, this is going to happen? They do. Um, yeah. and. I don't know that they're actually thinking that there is a strict tipping point. I think that they see the momentum behind this right now and they know that they've got a good thing going. Yeah. Right. So the gas suppliers, the people doing the conversions of engines, um, the fleet owners themselves Mm -hmm. seeing the benefits of a natural gas vehicle. I think everybody is seeing these benefits and it has taken time. And I don't think it's a tipping point in terms of sales or or that side of thing. I think that the, the tipping point is really when people realize natural gas, it's not... 30 years ago. Right. Right. It's there's a difference before it was lack of liquid fuels. And so we looked at natural gas. Right. Now it's the abundance of natural right. gas. Right. Right? right. That's doing it. And so I think now the confidence is really picked up and people are really starting to lay some money down in terms of the industries that because they have that confidence that's here to stay. Well, Bill, thank you so much for bringing us up to date on natural gas vehicles. Thank you, Russ. You bet. And that wraps up my discussion with Dr. William Epling, Associate Professor of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering here at the University of Houston and President of the Natural Gas Vehicle Alliance. That also wraps up this episode of the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. 